uh, Chris, thanks for the introduction. And um, I'm gonna ask uh, uh, each of the students to just say a little bit more about um, you know, uh, you know, their c current condition. Uh, I might comment a little bit if you have been this past semester studying in, in person, online, or on hybrid. Uh, we can set the context for that because that's gonna be a part of the conversation point. So let me just, uh, Charlie, why don't we start with you? All of my classes are online. Uh, so and just re reintroduce yourself. Where are you from? Your major? Right, what so, year you're um, that kind of thing? Yeah. Here, Jimenez. Uh, my major is computer engineering. Uh, okay. Also a pre med as well. Oh wow. And all, uh, all of my classes have been online as, this semester, and next semester is half half. Uh, so I'm excited to see what it brings. Great. And where? And right now, are you are you uh, through the semester? Or are, you, are you still finishing up? Uh, our semester ends next week. Okay. Great. Okay. And did you um, did you live on campus while you were uh, while you were? No, I, I live I live off campus. You did. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. All right. Thank you, Charlie. Nice, nice to have you here. But Thanks. that's quite a major: computer engineering and and, and pre med. Wow. Okay. <laughs> Haley, how about you? Hi. Um, I'm Haley. I am a social work major at GCU. This is my second year. I'm hoping to graduate in two and a half. So oh, wow. um, I'm kind of on a tight schedule. Gotcha. Um, I am online this semester, completely online, um, all 20 of my credits. And next semester, I am hopefully planning to study abroad. I just got the oh, word. Wow. So that is obviously kind of a, an interesting Open situation in this sure. climate. But um, so I will be in person um, if I do end up studying abroad. And yeah, I'm glad to be here. And where, where are you looking at studying abroad? Uh, Costa Rica. Oh, wow. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. So, so far that program is on. You're, you're scheduled to go down there, yes? Yes, we um, we had a lot of back and forth, obviously, mm -hmm. you know, they're trying to make safety uh, the biggest priority. Um, and then they gave us the go ahead to, in spite of COVID, but then they didn't have enough wow. students to run the program. Oh, so wow. I, um, the day before Thanksgiving, we got the word that they were going to run it regardless of how many students were signed up. So I'm Fantastic. really excited to do that. Fantastic. Great. Now, Lauren. Hi everyone, um, my name is Lauren Pike. I'm a third year agricultural communication student at the University of Georgia. Uh, this semester has been kind of crazy. So most of my classes were some type of a hybrid format this mm, semester. Okay. Um, so it kind of varied. One was completely online um, with like no live lectures or anything, mm -hmm. just completely online kind of web reading style. Two of my courses were in person and online. So the professor taught in person for anyone that wanted to go, but it was encouraged that you do it mm -hmm. on Zoom. And then mm -hmm. one day a week, we all went and did like hands-on activities and things gotcha. like that. Um, one of my courses, I actually took a PE course this semester. Oh, so wow. that was in person, uh, that was pretty interesting to do during the COVID times. Um, having the social distance made like team activities and things like that rather difficult. Um, and then my last course was completely online as well, but with live lectures and things like that. Fantastic. And Claudio, how about yourself? Hi, my name is Claudio. I go to Black Hill State University. Um, I'm from Argentina. And most of my classes were in person. Um, however, they did give you the option to have a Zoom attendance. So mm -hmm. um, they recorded the classes and then you could go from my room here. So that's yeah. what I decided to do. I felt I'm safe for doing it that way. So I still had to be on a schedule, but from home. Gotcha. Okay, great. Well, thank you for um, uh, that. Um, let, me, um, uh, let me just start with um, uh, a question that's based on, so uh, NASPA, my organization, NASPA and Course Hero, we did a survey of 3,500 college students um, this past month um, uh, and uh, found some really interesting findings about how you all have been faring at, uh, across the country. Um, and one theme that has been fairly consistent um, is um, uh, uh, students reporting um, uh, uh, overall just a general um, decrease in their mental health um, as a result of the, all the things going on around, um, around the pandemic and the, the changes that, that have occurred. Uh, for the audience, I think you probably um, are aware that uh, you know, prior, prior to the pandemic, um, st student mental health issues were uh, an issue before the pandemic. Um, one in three, almost one in three students uh, express some sort of uh, challenge around um, depression or anxiety, uh, very common for this generation. Um, so you don't need to talk about your own experience, but I'm sure as you think about the people, your students, your friends and folks, um, what have you seen in terms of um, the ways in which um, 
uh, the pandemic and the and the changes in instruction have affected student mental health. What have you seen? And and uh, we'll talk a little bit about how the universities have responded in a minute. But just just from a personal standpoint, each of you can kind of share your thoughts. Uh, why don't we just start with Haley? Um, yeah, I would definitely say that the pandemic has had a huge impact on um, everyone that I've talked to, their mental health, college student or not. Mm. Um, a lot of my friends have had to move back in with their parents or, yeah. um, you know, be locked in their dorm room or something like that, where they feel really like caged in almost. And it's just, mm -hmm. it, it really, it's really a really hard thing to get through. And so many of us, when we have a day off, we're so used to like lounging around, mm -hmm. we'll watch TV, we'll procrastinate. And then when you're doing that for like six months, you realize that you become an entirely different person. So mm -hmm. mental health, personality, it, it all kind of came to a head. I feel like with COVID yeah. because we were just unfamiliar with the territory. Sure. Charlie, I see you nodding your head a lot. Have you found some similar experiences? Yeah. I mean, like I, from personal experience as well, but from also uh, my other computer science, computer science majors as well, friends, I have a lot of them and they always like tell me that uh, for them to do computer programming online, which uh, if Florida has done that, there's no face-to-face um, -face lectures for computer yeah. programming. Uh, and the classes are huge as well. Um, mm -hmm. They had told me that it's 300 or above, or above for the Zoom meetings. And they just express anxiety. They express, you know, concerns about their grades, their mm -hmm. ability to continue the courses, you know. And the teacher has noticed it too uh, because he sent us an email mm -hmm. uh, actually four weeks ago because uh, our third exam was approaching. And he said that uh, he was going to have to curb it because our grades were not you know, as it used to be because mm -hmm. of the pandemic. And he understands the situation that uh, that online, you know, coding is very difficult. It's it's always, it's been, it's been difficult, even if it was face-to-face. Sure. -face. <clears throat> online, you know, makes it even harder. And, you know, and the teachers, you know, has seen the effects of, you know, COVID. Yeah. Um, well, how, did, how did you personally react to that? Did, did, how did you feel about that email from your faculty member? How did that, 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 that well, was that meaningful for you? Uh, I was, you know, very, I was, I was, I'm going to be honest with you. I was struggling with my computer programming uh -huh. uh, at the beginning of the semester. Uh, and then it continued until like around maybe mid October where I was like a little bit, you know, anxiety was kicking in. Yeah. I, I was stressed out of my exams. Uh, work didn't help too, because, you know, I have to also work as well. Mm -hmm. So I was, you know, stressed out a lot, but uh, I found out, you know, that if I, you know, communicate with my teacher and ask him for mm -hmm. some sort of help, like, you know, uh, ask, give, give me like, you know, an additional day to take the exam or like give us an additional day, which actually he granted us. He actually gave us an additional day to take the exam mm -hmm. for all students in the class. And I feel like that kind of helped a little bit, you know, to alleviate mm -hmm. the stress. Yeah, that's great. Interesting. Um, Lauren, how about you? What's your experience been? Uh, for me, I think really the biggest thing I've seen is the lack of human interaction. Um, yeah. so I'm actually involved in several different organizations on campus. And so I'm used to being very constantly go, go, go. All of my friends are constantly mm -hmm. very go, go, go. And so when we come to this scenario where we're either confined to our apartments and dorms, and that's just our situation, we only see people over Zoom, or we're confined to our apartments and we don't have the ability to Zoom for the classes that don't offer lectures and things like that it really kind of forces us to isolate. And like, we still try and text back and forth, but just that isolation has caused so many people, um, mm -hmm. very good friends of mine that are very outgoing people, um, just to kind of go into that shell and not really break out. And then you also face the difficulties of like, well, you text your friends, hey, would you like to go to dinner? And some of them are like, yeah, I'm comfortable going to dinner. And then other ones are like, well, if, I get tested this week and then I have COVID mm -hmm. because I went to dinner. Like, it's just not something I can risk. So mm -hmm. then you can't mm -hmm. see your friends. You can't check up on your right. person. Right. And then when you're going to the in-person classes, you're worried about, well, did the person next to me do something crazy or go to a big gathering or whatever? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then on top of that, mm -hmm. as stressed as we are as students, I mean, in my experience, the professors are almost equally as stressed because at least yes. at the University of Georgia, they had to revamp their entire semester That's course. Right very little notice so they mm -hmm. are incredibly stressed and then they're dealing with family and a lot of them have their kids at home and things because their schools are online so it's just been really interesting to see um kind of the professors and the students face an obstacle together if you will um just yep. kind of bounce off yep. each other to see what mm -hmm. works 
Yeah, I know this is a, our focus is on the student experience, but um, thank you, uh, Lauren, for raising that. I think um, it's been pretty docu well documented that faculty, you know, it's been difficult for faculty, one, doing what you suggested, having to pivot to an online, but also many of them, even if you, if they're in a in-person class, feeling at risk for their own families, um, and um, uh, a lot of just general anxiety, I think, and stress among faculty and staff on campus. So thanks for raising that. Claudia, are you, um, I, I missed when you were um, introducing yourself. Are you living in the residence halls right now or are you on campus? I am not. I okay, you're home. Campus. You're okay. Yeah. Okay, gotcha. All right. Um, at, at home or in an apartment? I live in, I have roommates. I um, moved okay. off campus I see. in the middle of the pandemic, actually. I, okay. And you stayed with them in that off campus environment? Yep. And it's yeah. only a couple blocks away from the campus. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And so, um, um, have, what have you seen amongst your friends around this sort of this mental health issue? Similar issues? Yeah, um, I was taking some notes as you were speaking. Yeah. One of the main things I think, as uh, Lauren was saying, is the human interaction part. Yeah. Um, many times we underestimate how much we need the interaction with our faculty and staff members. Um, I was a resident assistant for three years before oh. moving off campus. Okay. And it's it's been incredible to see. Oh, sorry about that. It's been incredible to see how much um, students need to interact with uh, faculty in person many times to be able to get the concept that they need, get the extension. And it's been really hard, I think, to replace Zoom, replace the in-person interaction with Zoom. Yeah. Um, finally, the other thing that I noticed is the acceptance of changes. Many students are hesitant because they were sold something else a year ago when they um, right. Right. decided to attend a certain university so now they come and it's hard for them to understand why why there's not activities going on on campus and mm -hmm. why they can go watch a football game um, or why they have to take their meals in the room um, so I think the acceptance to change has been a big factor in, in, in yeah the so stress and anxiety that students mm -hmm. get mm -hmm. yeah so um, I I can tell you that every one of your universities has thought about mental health issues. Um, so they have, um, you know, uh, the counseling center, they provided more, there's more virtual counseling, all these things, all these things are happening on campus. But I guess I want to ask you though, do, do you feel like the university has, and it's not to critique your university, but could they have done more to sort of um, created a, uh, uh, awareness for you of, of resources that are available for um, for helping students? I'm just curious. Um, I would like to share a little bit of my personal experience. Yeah. I, um, I had coronavirus um, oh. a couple of months ago. And you know what the CDC guideline says, um, after 10 days of no symptoms, you're able right. to go back to normal. But I think the main thing is that you don't always go back to normal. Um, even past the 10 days, I, I have plenty of people tell me that they feel like they're not there as uh -huh. much as they want it to be. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So it's very hard for faculty and staff, I think, to to be flexible to guidelines that many times the administration doesn't really tell you to follow. Um, so the 10 days, after the 10 days, they were like, okay, well, now you can come back to class, you can come back to your internship. But how do I explain to them that it's been 10 days, but I'm, I'm really not ready to go mm -hmm. back. Mm -hmm. um, so I wish there was a little bit more support on that side in the matter of yeah. each, each case is different. And, and right. we, we can, I mean, yes, younger individuals have less chances of, of getting COVID to a degree in which they need hospitalization. But that doesn't mean that many of us are going to have um, yeah. things well past the 10 days. Yeah, I mean the the COVID fog they've t they call it, um, yeah. which is what you're addressing, has been you know um, documented in the medical community. So uh, that's sort of interesting. Um, um, I, I noticed in the chat, uh, uh, one of the uh, attendees said she starts her class every class with a short mindfulness activity, which I think is awesome. Um, um, I, I guess have you are there any standout things that faculty have done in your class? I mean, um, Charlie, you mentioned that. Um, uh, a little bit more flexibility on, on exams, that kind of thing. Are there some other examples that we could tell the faculty on this call, like what, what has been working for you, what you wish was happening um, on, in the class? Any examples that you could share? So, um, so this is my first semester at UF. I transferred from the community college. Okay. So my previous school, um, what they did is they hired um, temporary uh, workers to serve as counselors. So that way they have more people, you know, accessible instead of having, you know, a certain amount of group people being overloaded 
because they had that issue. Uh, I was in student government back in my community college, and we we discussed this on this uh, on our student online senate meeting that a lot of the counselors were overrun, they were overloaded. Yeah. So our response was to like hire temporary workers for them to be mm -hmm. less you know stressed, and more students can get you know the help and attention that they need, so they can be so they can you know be successful in the throughout the you know entire of the semester. Because I noticed that if students don't get help, um, you know they tend to you know not not do well in their courses. You know, it can impact yep. their ability, you know, to succeed right. later on. And yep. so that's one thing I was proud of my, you know, community college for them doing. Mm -hmm. yeah, so at good. UF, my first semester, I noticed that uh, because I had also, you know, uh, a counselor at UF. Um, I noticed that I, only, I was only seeing them once every two weeks because they were over overloaded with so many appointments. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, once every two weeks, is, you know, it's, it's good, you know, I mean, I, I would still take it. Yeah. Because, you know, still some help, but it's not, you know, I feel like they should, you know, do the same thing, you know, and hire more temporary workers. And also, you know, it helps the community because you're also, you know, giving em employment to people who are, on the, you know, who need it as sure. well. So. Sure. Yeah, I can tell you that uh, over the last five, 10 years at colleges, I've really struggled with create, having enough counselors to meet the demand as the, as the mental health issues have come up. One of the things that <clears throat> we won't dig into here, but um, that the, uh, there's more opportunities for telecounseling. So you can actually do something from your computer, which isn't necessarily always as good as in person, but at least gives you some of that contact. And many of the universities are, are doing that. Um, so one of the things that um, I'm just curious is one of the findings of our survey, which was uh, consistent with some other surveys is that um, we've, uh, that students re are reporting, and I'm not gonna ask you to identify this behavior for you, but maybe the people you know, but students are reporting that they are drinking less, binge drinking less, and using marijuana less in the pandemic. Now that might be because many of you are home and it's not as cool to do either one of those things when your parents are upstairs. But in general, I'm just curious, have you noticed a change in behavior of students? And then actually when the other part was that as the students were in the survey we did, are actually say they're spending more time on classwork than they did before, more so on homework, more time studying. Curious if that has been your experience, not on the, you know, you don't have to comment on the alcohol and marijuana for yourself, but have you seen any changes in student behaviors? Um, personally, I'd kind of love to touch on that as well as your last question to kind of time together. Um, I even saw someone asked in the chat about making assignments shorter. So yeah. one of the things I love that my professor did um, was she gives us days where we have scheduled class time and lets us work on assignments like semester long assignments during those time periods. Nice. But personally, I'm spending probably, I'd say two to three times more time on school assignments than ever. And I've always been like a dedicated straight A and B student. Like I've always been really, really tough on myself with my studies. But this semester in particular, I get up at about nine o'clock in the morning. I sit in front of my computer on Zoom meetings until about four o'clock. Four o'clock, I'm done. So that's basically a work day right there, a little short of a work day because I don't even take an hour for lunch. It's Zoom back to back to back. But then when I get done at four, I would love to, you know, go do something for a hobby, go out, go shopping, go try and see friends if that's possible, try to do something. But instead, I have three papers I need to write, videos I need to edit as a communication student. And so then four o'clock rolls around. It's like, okay, well, I'm still sitting in front of the computer screen until nine o'clock at night. Well, that's 12 hours every single day that I'm sitting in front of a computer. Mm -hmm. Not to mention mm -hmm. I'm a student worker working remotely. So the days I don't have classes, because that's my Monday, Wednesday, Friday schedule. Well, Tuesday, Thursday, I work from nine o'clock in the morning until 2 p.m. in front of the computer. And then again, I've got all that homework that is on the computer. It's typing papers, editing videos. And even though I'm a communication student, I'm seeing that in all of my friends. Um, I have friends that are athletic trainers that are education majors and all of us are looking at spending upwards of 10 to 12 hours in front of a computer screen. And so then not only the mental issues that causes just the stress and anxiety, kind of like what was touched on, but like I can firmly tell you almost every single night I go to bed with a migraine, my eyes are dry, just those That's basic tough. things yeah. looking at a computer. And so just having the professors being understanding and giving us those extra times to work and being understanding when they get mm -hmm. an email from a student. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Similarly, I also had COVID recently um, over the oh, summer. Wow. Okay. And yeah. So uh, just understanding when that happens, we don't want to work on our coursework while we're <laughs> mm -hmm. sitting here thinking, okay, I'm a statistic in the middle of a pandemic. Like sure, that's sure. we want to focus on ourselves and say like, 
I didn't do anything wrong to get this. Sometimes you take all the right steps and you still get it. And so yeah. having to convince yourself of that with yeah. professors sending all these assignments different ways. Um, so just really being flexible and giving students that in-class time to work is something that yeah. I really yeah. Haley, you're nodding very strongly on this. What's what do you what's what are you what are you thinking? I all of the above. I agree with all yeah. of it. I definitely yeah. think that um, what and I, I'm fully I understand that it's um, a, a challenge also for the professors. I would not I could not imagine mm -hmm. being a professor in this climate. Um, but I think what's difficult for the students that maybe in the beginning and I know my professors are getting a lot better with it, but they were kind of treating us as in-person students and online students. They were expecting us to do basically double the work of attending the Zoom meetings, reading all the chapters, mm -hmm. plus the online DQs, yeah. plus all the assignments. And so it kind of creates this thing of, well, I'm going to class, but then they're you know, not really doing what we're supposed to be doing in class because we're all having technology problems or whatever. And then, so that's an hour and a half gone. And now I have to sit and read the chapter. And then I have a thousand word essay to write or 3000 word essays to write. And so it just becomes this like compiling thing of where does it end? Um, yeah. So I, I, every Sunday I'm, I work full time also. And so every Sunday I'm yeah. sitting in front of my computer from, I don't know, 7 a.m. to sometimes 10 p.m., 11 p.m. Yeah. just because that's that's what it takes to to get yeah. all my work done um mm -hmm. and obviously you know some some of that can't be helped you know the the course sure. has its um it's the assignments that are benchmarks and things that must be done and we have to you know do things to earn our grade um but one of the things that one of my really good friends she goes to a college in wisconsin and her professors have been so understanding of um kind of the same thing that Charlie touched on when he talked about, you know, um, being understanding. And if the student emails you, it's not, it's probably not an excuse. And it's something mm -hmm. about like, there's, there's something that came up or they have four essays that just got away from them um, or treating everything kind of by a case by case basis. It's, um, it's being, being hard and being strict and following all the rules right now, I think is a mistake. Um, I'm going to be honest because I don't think that um, treating everybody the same way right now is going to get us anywhere. Interesting. Okay. Thanks for sharing that. We're going to shift gears here a little bit. Um, I know we've been talking about um, classes and and, uh, and and this whole movement online and some of the mental health issues, that kind of thing. So good conversation. Um, I want to also just going to talk about some other things that are happening in our country that are affecting you as students. Um, um, and, uh, you know, as, as we all have watched since the murder of George Floyd, um, we have um, seen the emergence, reemergence of Black Lives Matter as a significant issue. And also um, a, a lot of activism from students um, towards their institutions around uh, anti-racism work um, or um, a variety of other things that are going on in campus. I'm just curious for you as you are trying to do be a student, you know, what's what, what's happening in you and around you that you think affects you as well? And, and um, have you seen some of the national movements around Black Lives Matter in particular, and also some of the um, issues around police reform? Has that, has, that, has that bubbled up with you and your friends as a conversation point? How's that, how's that um, going for you? And uh, Claudia, when do you start? Um, I think it has. Um, I would love to see more commitment from universities. I think sometimes it's easy for them to make a statement. Yep. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's the end of it. But I think this is a, a pivotal point for all of us to stop and think about all these injustices and all these reforms mm -hmm. that need to be made. And I think if universities are able to create programs for different academic or advising purposes, I think they could also create programs for um, actively be anti-racist, um, even on, on, on times in which we can meet in person, because I would love to be able to meet and have debates with people on campus and be able to share ideas. Mm -hmm, and that many mm -hmm. times is not possible, but I think universities definitely uh, should invest more into ensuring that students are able to share their opinions, because I think it's, it's been a stressing semester for all of us, and, and, and those spaces are very much needed, not only in person or on campus, but also on the online settings. Yeah, Claudia, one of the things that I've heard from um, uh, university staff is that they have tried to create online spaces for these kind of conversations. 
Um, nice. But uh, you, as you just sort of went through, you're also zoomed out that getting into another conversation on Zoom is probably not a lot of energy for that. So I think it's one of those interesting kinds of things. I think we'd like to engage students in these kind of conversations, but we know that you're also, you know, you spend your whole day on a computer, so it makes it a little more um, difficult. Um, uh, any any of the others of you have thoughts on on some of the activism that we see in this country and and how it has played into the your your role as a student? Yeah, sure. Something. So uh, at UF, uh, I joined also student government, and as soon as oh, we heard about Rich Floyd and you know and the many other you know cases that happened after that, we decided you know uh, to go to the student body president and uh, and create a video and a video for the student body to tell them that racism is not okay and you know it's not part of our college experience you know and there's you know in you know college is supposed to be about you know diversity you know welcoming everybody all cultures you know knowledge you know backgrounds everything you know and the video you know the purpose of it was for it to you know to teach you know other students you know that it's you know to welcome everybody, you know, to like include everybody, you know, and be friends, be friendly, you know, and make everybody, you know, feel safe in campus or feel safe, you know, in the community. Mm -hmm. how, did, how did you feel like that video was received by the students? Uh, actually, though, um, when we had our, own, our our Sunday meeting every Wednesday at 4 p.m., we actually had, uh, and actually, I mean, it was a huge explode of viewership. We usually only have like 100 people, you know, log in, but we had, at that time, we had 3,000 people logged in and all them commented and saying that wow. it was really helpful and it was really you know eye-opening that you know that the student body was you know was able to do that and that you know it was you know a welcoming experience it was a welcoming idea and that you know and other students like they kept you know typing comments on the chat that said that that when you know when school opens back again they would you know form clubs or you know talk to people and you know form partnerships friendships and all that stuff Good, cool. I'm glad you had that kind of positive reaction. Um, you might have noticed uh, about a month ago, actually, because it, it's a month ago today, actually, um, that we had an election in our country. Um, and uh, one of the uh, things that we already know, um, first of all, it was record turnout among many sectors, but the youth, for, youth uh, vote turnout was um, far exceeded um, even our expectations about um, about uh, uh, participation in the election. So that, so clearly uh, young people were very activated to get out and vote um, uh, in particular swing states uh, in Florida, Georgia, um, in particular Michigan, uh, the student vote made a, actually actually a big difference in the outcome of the election. Um, so I'm just curious, um, you know, first, d did, do you think that that kind of energy and activism is going to continue as the year goes on? Do you see this kind of, this something as part of your generation that you're more plugged into these issues and, um, you know, or was it a kind of a one and done kind of thing? So Haley, tell me, what do you think? I really hope that um, our generation continues to participate in things like this and to raise their voices when they feel like mm -hmm. um, that they should be heard. Because, um, I mean, I can only speak from my experience, my friends' experiences, but I know that we grew up in a time where um, we were always told that, you know, the adults are having a conversation. Um, it's time for the kids <laughs> to go somewhere else and play. And when we had an opinion, we felt like we weren't allowed to, to voice mm -hmm. that opinion. And we've, you know, the four students on this panel, we've come of age. Um, we have the opportunity now, like so many others, to, to share what we think and to be a part of that adult conversation. And I think it's important that we do that because... Um, and I know this was another question um, that we might get to, uh, but I think that um, it's important for us to share what we think because, you know, society changes. One minute we're a little more conservative, one minute we're a little bit mm -hmm. uh, less conservative. And so I think that um, it's important for us to share what we think because it doesn't matter if somebody else's opinion is different than yours. We all need to respect each other and recognize that their opinions and, um, and just recognize that you know everybody has a voice if you don't like what i have to say that's great you can you cannot like what i have to say you have that right and i will you know respect that and um i don't know it's just it's really nice that so many people felt that way during this election and are continuing to feel that way about the issues that they think are important yeah, yeah. Claudia, i think it looks like you want to add something yeah 
Yeah, um, I just wanted to mention one. I think one of the main things that brought stress and anxiety to this semester to me wasn't only coronavirus, but was everything going on with the election. Um, sure. In my sure. personal experience, on my birthday, on July 6th, uh, there was a new regulation passed by Immigration and Customs Enforcement that said that if uh, universities went to an online mode, international yes. students would have to leave um, within 10 days of the university right. changing. Right. Um, that was something that affected me throughout the year um, mm -hmm. because it came down to the point in which I knew if, a certain, if the Trump administer, uh, administration won, um, they were going to continue to push on those regulations, which... Uh, make things extremely hard for me. You know, I'm thinking of graduate school and going back to Argentina and risking of infecting other people and risking of not getting a visa. That was, that was, mm -hmm. I think, yeah. as stressful as coronavirus yeah. in my personal yeah. opinion. Yeah. Thanks for mentioning it. Somebody on the, on the panel, on the audience had asked about international students. And this has been a very difficult time for international students, the virus in particular, because, uh, uh, many uh, international students couldn't uh, get home um, after when we closed, uh, and uh, and uh, given the policies of the current administration, new visa, visas for new international students has been very challenging. We see now uh, that international student enrollment is a, is at a um, is at a, for, has declined for the first time in, in a decade in the United States, and so we're seeing the impact of of, of that. And I also want to acknowledge. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, just while we're talking about this issue that um, uh, uh, the current administration's policy around DACA students as well has been also very, very challenging in terms of um, students who, um, who uh, may not um, feel very safe um, being on a college campus and having their names identified, that kind of thing. So just a, a variety of things that add to that stress. So Claudio, thanks for, for mentioning that. I, I wanted to, Haley, you, you, you said something that I want to kind of get some additional reactions on. Uh, first of all, uh, your generation, which I am so happy about, by the way, your generation is the most activist generation we have seen maybe since the 60s. Um, certainly, uh, maybe the 80s and the, in the uh, apartheid, anti-apartheid era, but um, your generation is very engaged in, in, in politics and in social issues, social justice issues. I think this is a very encouraging thing to see, not a lack of apathy, but actually real energy around that. And, and Haley, your comment um, is what we all want to hear from students. And that is what we want to hear you say is we want the, an openness to hearing all perspectives, not, not just liberal, not just pro democrat, you know, progressive, not just conservative. In other words, that this ought to be a time of engagement with different perspectives. Having said that, I will tell you that higher education, college and universities around the country have been um, severely criticized for um, uh, being um, not being open to conservative viewpoints. You know, in general, higher ed tends to be a little bit more progressive. Students are progressive, more progressive than conservative. Faculty are, staff are. And um, one of the criticisms is it's not okay to be conservative on campus. Can you just give me a sense of how you feel um, about that? And do you, do, you, do, you have, do you also feel like sometimes conservative voices get, get shut out? And if so, what can we do to make um, uh, to reach Haley's um, uh, nirvana, which is that we all get to hear each other's uh, perspective. Lauren, let me start with you. Um, so I would definitely say that it can kind of go either way. I think that regardless of kind of what side of the political spectrum you fall on, um, conservatives can have a tendency to say, you know, that people who are more liberal might not listen to their opinions and mm -hmm. people who are more liberal will say that conservative or vice versa. But I just, I definitely do think that you are correct in saying I have also heard a great deal of conservative students feeling unsure and not necessarily unsafe um, voicing their opinions, but feeling like it's just not wise to do so, feeling like if they do, they're going to lose a lot of their friends because as you stated, the majority of college kids are typically a little more liberal. Um, so I definitely think it is an issue that several students have faced. Um, I'm not sure that I know the proper way to fix it, if you will, um, because yeah. I feel like there's not really a good solution either way, because I feel like both parties could feel either way. Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I just wanted to point out uh, many times, as you were saying, universities are criticized. But I think it's also important to look at 
other areas of our life, um, you know, not only universities are having issues with this, cities oh, are that's having true. Issues. Oh, that's absolutely um, true. So, <laughs> so I think it's, it's, it's kind of a little rude for, for people that is not in college to say, oh, these university kids, they don't want to listen to either or side when we have all this other stuff going on, not only on university, but in the workplace, right. maybe right. community places. Um, right. So I think that's important to note as well. Yeah, yeah. That, yeah. That's a, it's a great point, Claudio. You know, um, when we ask this question, and we and, and I think it's true, we, uh, colleges get uh, attacked for this on this issue, but but this is a societal issue, right? We are more polarized in, in America and actually globally than we've ever been before. Um, um, people are much more less likely to be in the middle, much more likely to be on the end, and we don't seem to be listening to each other very well. I guess I would say, let me just editorialize a little bit from my perspective as somebody who has spent 40 years working with college students. My, I think the hope for a better society, the hope for um, a, con a Congress that will talk to each other, uh, hope for um, um, people in cities will talk to each other is, is, is you. Um, I mean, it, it really is a, um, uh, if we can use, develop the muscle of being able to hear different perspectives and being to disagree respectfully and have and have dialogue, we can do that at the college level. I think we have more hope to be able to do it outside of um, outside, and we can build on that. So that's my kind of crazy optimism. So I really I really hope that your generation can help us um, move from where we are to be um, to to respect the, the differences of opinion that you would find. So we have a, a few minutes left. I want to just touch on a, a whole other topic here, if you don't mind. Um, uh, most of you are at least a year away from graduation. I think, Claudio, you're pretty close. Are you a senior? Yeah. Okay. All right. So, um, uh, uh, I, so arguably, this may be one of the worst job markets that we have ever seen, or certainly in the last decade. I know you're aware of that. Um, so it puts, I think, a premium on preparing yourself for this difficult job market. Um, and I guess, if, can you tell me a little bit about how you're thinking about your career preparation? And how you're preparing yourself to be as competitive as possible when you enter this um, this job market, which will probably take a couple of years to um, to un unravel a little bit. Um, you know, I think the 2008-2009 recession, which you grew up in as a young person, it, uh, was difficult. That job market was difficult. We saw some some challenges there for college students. So I guess I'm curious of what your thinking is right now as you're getting ready for these next couple of years, or Claudio, for you getting ready to graduate. What's your thoughts about how to be best prepared? I certainly don't mind sharing um, my yeah, thoughts. Sure. So it has been very difficult, um, kind of touching back on what we said earlier about with all the Zoom classes and the human interaction. Mm -hmm. um, networking with your professors is always something I know myself and many of my friends have kind of really hounded on outside of the, the lecture content and the parts of the class that are the actual class, but getting to know your professor so you can have those recommendation mm -hmm. letters. Great suggestion. It doesn't happen over Zoom. You can't get to know a professor yeah. well enough yeah. over Zoom right. that you feel comfortable asking them for a recommendation mm -hmm. letter, or you feel comfortable saying, hey, would you mind proofreading my resume? It just doesn't happen. Yeah. Um, yeah. But on the flip side of that, I know a lot of people this summer, especially that um, either chose not to take the courses or had a little extra time on their hands um, have been able to use that time to kind of do like certificates online and get um, mm -hmm. things like that mm -hmm. to boost their resume. Fantastic. So I see both sides of the spectrum, but personally, I miss the human interaction of being able to network with people within my communication field. Um, mm -hmm. Personally, my college, UGA, has started a mentor program where you can go online, fill out a survey, enter your kind of stuff, and they'll help match you with someone that's in your Great. career field. And that yep. way you can Zoom with them once a month, kind of get to Great. know things like that. Um, Great suggestion, so yeah. That for yeah. any colleges. Yeah, yeah, awesome. Yeah, I think, uh, I, think fa I mean, since we have faculty on the line here, faculty can play a really important role in that process a little bit in helping connect you with people in the field. Um, I know that one of the losses last summer was a lot of internships and practicums were lost. So helping, helping that process as well, it's going to be a little more, you probably need more guidance in that, um, in that as well. Kelly, were you going to say something? Oh, um, I was just going to, again, agree with her. Um, yeah. okay. In a normal climate, it's really, it's really nice to take advantage of the personal interaction. Um, right. I know that I got a lot of my um, high school teachers to recommend me for college mm -hmm. and, you know, um, first semester of college, I was able to get some recommendations. 
Um, but I would also probably say that um, it's important to do things outside of the classroom also. Um, getting involved in clubs is a great way to do that. Again, um, being active in whatever it is that you care about, whatever is important to your career, but also um, doing things that kind of push you a little bit ahead, maybe going the extra mile. Um, just an example from my own life, obviously as a social work major, I'm probably never going to have to look far for a job because that's just the climate that we live in. Um, a lot of yeah. need for mental health professionals. That's right. But um, I um, was given the opportunity actually. Um, so in the state of Arizona, we have something called DDD, um, Department of Developmental Disabilities. And so anyone that works with people in that climate for a year, um, they have that year of experience, then they can go out and get a job in social work without having a degree. So That's if right. anybody's interested yeah. in that, there's yeah. a tip right there. Um, but know. I actually had the opportunity to do that. I've been working with children with autism for the last year. And so that's just going to be something else that in addition to my bachelor's degree, when I go on and get my master's degree, I'm always going to have that year of social work yep. experience before I even got my bachelor's. So that's just that's one great. thing that you can do an in internship or something like that, that um, isn't in the classroom that awesome. just bumps you up a little that's bit. Great. Well, we're out of time. We're out of time. It's been a great conversation. I want to just share one thing that uh, one of the uh, participants said as we were in the middle of this conversation, in case you missed it and said, you guys give us hope for a better future. Thank you for sharing your perspectives. There's been a lot of just really positive comments about your authentic responses to these questions, um, you know, the way you're approaching this. Um, I think it gives all of us a little bit of an insight into what the experience has been like for um, students uh, in this very difficult time period. Obviously, we it's, it's hard on us, but we know it's been hard on, on you. And we look forward to, obviously, for all of us getting through this and getting back to what might look like a normal sound. But thank you to each of you. The best of luck to you. And thank you so much for taking some time out of what we know is a busy schedule um, to, uh, to share these perspectives. We just don't get a chance to hear from students this way very often. And uh, it, it was fantastic.